She was a lovely, sweet girl. A real gem. Always kind. Always hopeful she could do some good. Words can't express how much we're going to miss her. Our hearts go out to Claire's parents and their grief. All of us who loved her, sharing their pain. Nothing can replace her. she been working in the town? Three years. Were they expecting any trouble that night? No, just a normal routine call. The new alarm had a delay switch. WPC Campbell and PC Willow got there before it went off. There have been three false alarms already that week. No chance. I'll check the shop. Yeah. Again. Claire? Claire! Witnesses? <sighs> Afraid so. Sir, now tell him what you saw. I was coming down Wide Marsh Street when I heard the bang. And this kid come belting down the road past me. Is there any idea who it was? Aye. It looked like the Warwick lad, Paul. still pleading not guilty. You haven't heard the best bit. We found a gun in the skip, just like yours. But 
but this one works. It fires bullets. You have blood all over your trainers. Where the hell did that come from? I was at home all night, wasn't I? Ask me, Ma. I was. All right? Don't fart around with us, Paul. You and Claire were almost mates, weren't you? Probably paid the old game of Paul down at the youth club. So what? Well, she told your probation officer that you were a good lad. Well, she thought you were out of the woods, apparently. She wasn't like the rest of us, was she, Paul? For some reason, she went out of her way to help miserable little villains like you. Even when other people said she was wasting her time. But she didn't listen. She thought she could help make you better. And you shot her heart out for a lousy packet of fags. What had she ever done to you? She never hurt anyone in her life. Never thought of herself. Always put other people first. Was that it? Did being with her make you feel like dirt? If it wasn't you, mate, who was it? Pigs get what they deserve, don't they? You're filth! You want us all dead, do you? Is that why you shot Claire? What if I did? Did you shoot her? Yeah! It was brilliant! I can still remember the feeling! Bang! Bang! Con's at four. Got to catch a 130 from Liverpool Street. Second class. Bloody legal aid. Just returning your Phipson. Such a shame we can't find a way of evening the contest up a bit. Nothing more unsatisfying than prosecuting a defendant who's already confessed. And judging by the almost tangible air of despondency in here, I presume things are not improving in the defence camp. We thought of putting Valium in your tea. You could always concede that the confession was obtained unfairly, Peter. I'm afraid my officers weren't even sporting enough to break the rules a little bit. You can never find a bent copper when you need one. Mm. Well, enjoy the conference. Oh, and don't let the poor boy cave in now. I'm looking forward to a few days out in the sticks. I could do the rest. Alex, I know it's really last minute, but you're the only one in Chambers who's ever done an asylum case. One case doesn't make me an expert, especially if I lost. No, no, I'm sure you'll find it quite straightforward. Money's not too good, though. Ah, oh, so that's why you want me to do all the legwork. Don't be cynical. I'm extremely busy with my commercial practice, so I need a really first-class junior. Besides, communicating with foreigners has never been my strong suit. immigration department. Stay there, Ian. Are you this woman's solicitor? You can't do this. We've got a judicial review listed for next week. She's outstayed her visa, if you'd like to explain to her that we're taking her into custody. I can understand perfectly well. This is outrageous. She's not going anywhere until the court's decision. She'll be held until the hearing. Move aside, sir. Do as they say, Martin. There's no point annoying them. This kind of intimidation is never going to work. You can't crack a spirit like hers. Just doing our job, sir. Jeremy Alder Martin, looks like you're having a spot of bother. <laughs> we don't get this order quashed. She's on her way home to a ten-year stretch in an African jail. Mm, ah. This was meant to be the country. It was. Once. Not if 
defending that animal who killed a copper, are you? Wouldn't fancy your job. speak to me. It's not as if you've got an obvious defence. I can't tell you what to say, but if you're going to go not guilty, you've got to help us. You wouldn't believe me. Nobody else does. We just want the truth, Paul. You don't have to worry about what we think. Why did the police pick on you, Paul? They just wanted me down. Everybody does. I've heard the tapes. You probably went through hell in that interview room, but at the moment, all the jury have got is you saying bang, bang. They picked on me, didn't they? Just like they always do. How? Did they threaten you? Yeah. You don't sound very sure. You could have kept quiet. You had your solicitor with you. Then they get you for that as well. They say you have something to hide. You didn't have to confess. I shut them up, didn't I? So why aren't you pleading guilty? Because I never done it. Do you know who did? Where did the blood on your shoe come from? It didn't get there by itself. Why don't you just piss off back to London? And what about the gun? Look, son, you may not like me, but you don't have much option. Either you cooperate or you can say goodbye to the next 20 years. Yeah, you'd like that, wouldn't you? You're all the same. Poxy lawyers and coppers, which are clever questions. You're all the bleeding same. Oh. This isn't helpful. Get off me, you bleeding. The police have got a pile of unused statements. Maybe we'll turn something up there. Is he usually this cooperative? Normally he keeps his mouth shut. I've never seen him react like this. But he hasn't got any convictions for violence. Just theft and burglary. A bit of taking and driving away. Maybe he should just go guilty. You, know, you think enough people have given up on him already? You don't think he did it, do you? I've been known to be wrong. It's all there. Cheers, Clive. They knocked on every door in a half-mile radius. It's mostly copies of their notebooks. One each, then. Oh, these must be Claire's things. Copy, please. Her whole life reduced to this. Rations, James. They have a banger. Not bad, Mum. I don't think I could stomach it just now. You'll end up as skinny and anemic as your student daughter. Yeah, Grandad. I'm really about to fall down a grating. There's nothing wrong with you that a few rashes wouldn't put right. I thought it was only going to be three days. Maybe he's lonely. <laughs> Said it was business, but. I haven't seen much evidence of it. You must be doing something right. You haven't cooked me breakfast in ten years. Oh, 
Early start, Jeremy. Busting a gut for a complete and utter loser. Makes two of us. Now, another young Earl with cocaine down his boxes. Oh, if only. No, she's some screaming trot who likes to say rude things about African politicians. Not that he's prejudiced or anything. There's just one thing worse than a sympathetic barrister, my old pupil master used to say. A sympathetic barrister in a skirt. The report from Diana Plant, family social worker. Anything useful? Nothing devastating. Single mother, violent father, brain damaged brother in and out of care. Paul drifted into crime when he was about 12. Nothing that might help get us home on diminished responsibility. No. She says he's quite bright. I've got copies of Claire Campbell's diary, hairdressing appointments, entries that look like dates with a boyfriend. Oh, and the prescription that I found in her wallet is for the morning after pill. It's two weeks old. She never collected it. Something I've missed? The brother was brain damaged in a car accident three years ago, joyriding. Paul was driving. I'm going uptown. I'll bring you back some chips. You have to take them, Terry. You want to stay here, don't you, love? If anyone comes to the door, you don't answer, all right? Hello, Mrs. Warwick. Hi, Mrs. Warwick. That's Paul Roy. Right? a lot till Friday. Thanks. It's getting hard to cope by myself. Where's Terry? At home. I didn't want to bring him out. You never know what he'll do. How is he? The doctor put him on some stronger tablets. He's getting worse. The social services want to take him back. If only you'd done what I said and kept your mouth shut. You thought the police were bad. You wait for the trial. I couldn't help it. James, the little brother's record. Assault, assault with intent to resist arrest, robbery, ABH, all in the last two years. Who's leading who astray? You don't think Terry did it? Well, something's stopping Paul telling us the truth. Now, if he was being threatened, he'd say, wouldn't he? But he's taking the blame. Maybe he has done since the accident. It's a bit of a stretch, James. Now, even if you're right, you can't stop Paul taking the rap if he wants to. I know. You can't just blame Terry without Paul instructing you to. No. Maybe it won't come to that. It's beyond a joke, Dad. You'd think all students were doped up, anorexic hippies the way he goes on. They were in my day. 
can't you just tell him to chill out and watch a video or something, instead of winding us up all the time? Well, I don't think he's a chilling out kind of guy. I'm just uh, popping up to town. Off out on the razzle, are we? Well, there isn't a lot of action around here. I thought I'd show these young shirkers how to party. Ciao. He's losing it. <laughs> making a very good job of it. Dad? The old stop out. Uh, uh, I'm awfully sorry. I, I didn't mean to wake you. I, I seem to have... Mislaid my key. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Go back to bed, Matt. Uh, James, I hope you don't feel you have to tell Lizzie about her septuagenarian father shinnying over garden walls. Oh, fine, fine. <laughs> Aren't you wondering where on earth I'm being? Well, either you've got some very broad-minded friends, or it's a woman. A woman? At his age, who? Well, someone with plenty of stamina. <laughs> you think he's getting a bit senile? No. He's just randy. Well, it could be anybody. It could be a terrible old gold digger. Well, invite her to lunch at the weekend, if you're worried. We can all give her the third degree. So what are you going to tell her? Bad news. Let's hope she's ready for it. Rather you than me. You're not saying they will send me back? No, you see, the court has to be quite convinced that you're in real danger of persecution as a result of your political beliefs now. And this is a substantial hurdle. I will be arrested and locked up as soon as I step off the plane. The really big problem for the judge is that the Ivory Coast authorities now deny any interest in you. Mr. Alder Martin, I am a peaceful, democratic political campaigner. But in my country, I am being branded a dangerous extremist. Your country signed the Geneva Convention to protect people like me. In theory, yes. But not in practice. <laughs> what happened to the famous justice of this country? You have given up before the case has begun. Miss Baruba, I'm simply trying to explain to you how the... Do you want to fight for me? I can get another lawyer. Miss Baruba, I assure you I shall do everything within my power, within the law, to keep you in this country. I expect my lawyer a fire in his belly. What the bloody hell does she think I am, an idiot? She's damn lucky to get me at all. Give me a good negligence action any day. Jeremy, have you thought how it might feel if you actually won for her? <laughs> it's highly unlikely. She got to you, didn't she? I bet you've never felt consumed with passion about your work. Not like she does about hers. Now, just a minute. What is this? Keeping the lid on all that bottled-up emotion. Must be a real strain. How dare you? Listen, Alex, I'm a bloody good lawyer, and I'll do my level best to help that woman. Does she know that? You're all she's got. Yes, that fact hadn't completely passed me by. Looks like Peter's got his feet under the table. Good evening. Good evening, Governor and Piper. Would you mind signing these, please? Mm -hmm. It's our ladies' night next week. If you're still here, you and your wife will be very welcome. How kind. But I think she might have something penciled in. Thanks. Welcome to the provinces. Fancy a baby sham? <laughs> well, cheers. Pleasant little place, don't you think? Never so friendly. What are you having, Peter? Whiskey, thank you. Allow me to introduce my colleagues, James Kavner, Julia Piper, um, Roger. On the case with him, are you left? They're defending. Oh, that must be fun. Not particularly. Come on. You know as well as I do, he's guilty. Isn't that for the jury to decide? He's banged to rights, isn't he? He's confessed, for God's sake. 
What do you suggest? That we dispense with the formalities and proceed swiftly to a public hanging? Sounds all right to me. Are you a magistrate by any chance? No. Oh, you should apply. They're always on the lookout for people with progressive ideas. Maybe I will. That's blown your invitation to the Rotarian dinner dance? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, look, it's brain death. <laughs> Come on, brain death, get your ball back. What's the matter, you great puff? My big brother to stick up for you. He should have shot you and all. He never done it. Of course he done it, you pillock. He's a nut on like you! He never! Ever doing them? They're scum! <laughs> Wait! Get up there! We were just having a laugh. We ain't done nothing. Shut up! Yeah? So what's this for then, Damon? I ain't a real one! Is that why you shot Claire? What if I did? Did you shoot her? Yeah! It was brilliant! I can still remember the feeling. Bang! Bang! Everybody inside now, as quick as you can. Which hospital is he in? The county. It's just a sprained shoulder. Where's me ma? Is she with him? He'll be fine. Who was it? Who done it? Marshall and his mates. You're not as brief, are you? I was duty solicitor. He had a replica pistol. Some of the others had knives. Terry was lucky. Why is he picking on your brother? He can't fight back, can he? What else do we know about this Marshall character? Ask Paul. He's his mate. Was. What about guns? Paul. If there is anything else you think we should know, anything at all, about Marshall or anyone else, this is your last chance to tell us. Life is a long time for something you didn't do. I'm going down, aren't I? That's largely up to you. I just have to take a chance. What has this marshal got against your boys? He's ignorant like the rest of them. He used to be Paul's friend, didn't he? Some mate. Who do you think got him nicking in the first place? What is he capable of? What do you take me for? A grass? Is that how Paul got his gun? Did he buy it from Marshall? How should I know? If you're his mother. I'd have thought you knew most things about him. Like whether he was protecting someone. He is refusing to help himself, Mrs. Warwick. There must be a reason. What can he do? He's been fitted up. They're always nicking him, blaming him for stuff he didn't do, even after he went straight. How long had he kept his nose clean? About six months, since Terry came out. I'll ask you again. Where were your boys when Claire was shot? At home with me watching telly. Just because he has a record doesn't make him a murderer. My boys don't lie to me. Not about nothing. It's a novel experience, I suppose, conducting a trial with no defense. We've got a defense, all right. We just can't use it. Why don't you just go back and confront him with it? It's not too late. He'll deny it. Better to keep him on edge for a while. We'll just have to take the fight to the other side. What, and sling mud, you mean? If that's all we've got. How well did WPC Campbell know Mr. Warwick? Well, very well. She used to work at the Craven Road Youth Club on evenings and weekends. We both helped out there. Well, Paul was a regular. 
What were her feelings for him? Well, Claire genuinely cared about lads like him. She really believed she could make a difference. You've already told us, Officer Waller, that from what Claire said over the radio, she seemed to recognize the person by the doorway. Yes. If that person was Mr. Warwick, do you think she knew him well enough to have recognized him? Certainly. But she didn't say a name. Wait there. It's not usual procedure for a single WPC to pursue burglars by herself, particularly at night. No. And there had been other burglaries at these premises in the past, hadn't there? Quite a few. A few? And some false alarms. But there was still a chance that Claire would run into burglars. But they were usually only kids. Kids or not, burglars often carry weapons, don't they? Sometimes, yes. What was stolen in these other burglaries? Cigarettes, mostly, and um, lottery scratch cards. And where were they kept? In a little lock-up in the yard. The owner felt it was more secure than the shop itself. Were there any lights in this yard? Not until the alarm went off, after the shot. So when Claire went there, it was pitch black. Well, there would have been some light from the road behind. Enough to recognize someone 15 feet away, with their back towards you? Enough to shoot by. From what you knew of my client at the time, would you say he was someone capable of gunning down a police officer in cold blood? No. Since you have known him, have you ever seen him exhibit any violent tendencies whatsoever? No. But there are plenty of violent lads on the estate. Some. There always are. Like Damon Marshall, for instance? I understand you recently arrested him in possession of an imitation firearm. Yes. I don't think you believe my client shot Claire Kemble at all. The officer's speculation isn't evidence, Mr. Kavanagh. No more questions, officer. It's a 9mm Makarov, reactivated. The magazine contained two live rounds. The bullet that killed her was exactly the same. We recovered the spent case and dug the projectile out of the wall behind her. Describe the adaptations to the gun, if you would. Well, a new barrel's been roughly bored out and a firing pin fitted. Is that a difficult operation? Well, the parts could be obtained through mail order. Anyone with access to workshop tools could put them together if they knew what they were doing. How easy is it to obtain a gun like this? Well, very, if you know how to look. A hundred quid to someone in a pub or a disreputable dealer. Now, were any fingerprints found on the weapon? None. He was probably wearing gloves. Was Mr. Warwick's skin tested for gunpowder residue? Yes, but nothing turned up. Were any gloves found? No, he probably flushed them down the toilet. And where exactly did you find this gun? In a builder skipping Croston Street, about 200 yards from Warwick's house. The uh, tread on the shoe is identical to the footprint found next to Claire's body. And the DNA match between the blood on the shoe and Claire's blood was identical also. The defense do not dispute members of the jury that the blood on the shoe was Claire's. And the other item you found in the defendant's bedroom? So a deactivated 9mm Makarov. It's the same model as the murder weapon. But this one was perfectly legal. Uh, yes, it had been certified deactivated by the government proof house in Birmingham. The dealer had a batch of them done. They were imports from Russia. Do we know where this gun was bought? Yes, it was sold through a gunsmith's in Dagenham about a year ago. The shop didn't keep a record of who to. What do you know about the origin of the murder weapon? It's the same model. It may well have been part of the same importation. Thank you. Your turn.
This gun you found in Mr. Warwick's room was certified deactivated. In other words, it was nothing more than a toy. Well, not like any I ever had. According to the local press, in the three months since Claire Kemble's death, you've recovered more than 40 replica and deactivated handguns, mostly owned by teenagers. Yeah. It's almost as if every boy has to have one. Quite a status symbol. Well, it's a problem all over the country. But you found no functioning weapon in Mr. Warwick's house? No. And no ammunition? No. So the only connection between Mr. Warwick and the gun in the skip is the fact that in common with countless other young men, he had a perfectly legal, deactivated handgun of the same make. It's exactly the same model. He also had Claire's blood on his shoe. Ah, yes. The shoe. Was Mr. Warwick ever actually asked to identify the shoe as his? It was sent for analysis as soon as we found it. So he never did confirm it was his. Where exactly, in relation to the body, was the footprint found? Here. A single print just behind the body. How big was the gap between the body and the left-hand wall? Um, uh, three or four feet. Why do you think it was there? Someone running to the gate would have passed a couple of feet the other side of her. Yeah, well, you tell me. Maybe he went over to see what he had done. A single clear footprint, square in the middle of a pool of blood. Doesn't it position sound rather odd to you? No. Even when the wearer would have to have been squeezing between the body and the wall, rather than take the obvious route out of the yard? Oh, no, what are you saying? That I got another shoe and made that footprint myself? Did you? No. And I resent that suggestion. Thank you, officer. My lord, there's a brief matter I would like to raise in the absence of the jury. Very well. My lord, at the end of her cross-examination, Miss Piper accused Detective Sergeant Quixel of flagrant dishonesty. In effect, she accused him of planting WPC Campbell's blood on Mr. Warwick's shoe. Surely it now follows that Mr. Warwick's character must also be in issue. My lord, I did no such thing. It was D.S. Quixel himself who suggested it. But my learned friend adopted that allegation and sought a direct response to it. That must be right, Miss Piper. I certainly never intended to accuse the officer of dishonesty. But that was nonetheless the effect of what you said. I would submit that the defense have lost their shield and that Mr. Warwick's convictions may now be put to the jury. Go ahead, Mr. Foxcott. On the 13th of April, he was convicted of yet another offence of burglary, this time from an electrical goods shop. That's correct. Uh, he received a two-year probation order. So, since he was 12 years old, the defendant has accumulated a total of no fewer than 35 criminal convictions. Yes, uh, by any standards, it's an appalling record. Thank you. Oh, I think that's a convenient place to adjourn. 10.30 on Monday, members of the jury. Will the court rise? Forget it. It happens to the best of us. Sometimes I wonder whether I'm cut out for this job. Don't hang up your wig yet. I reckon you were onto something. This is where she fell. What's your theory? Claire looks around the gate, sees someone she recognises. What does she say? Oh, no, not again. It's dark. Maybe she thinks it's Paul. 
She knows he's not dangerous, so she walks in. When she gets here, he comes round, sees it's a policewoman and shoots. Makes a hell of a noise. He's scared senseless, runs for the gate. He's not going to stop an inspector. There must be lights going on all down the street. You're assuming we're talking about a rational individual. Do you park here every night? Yes. What about the night the policewoman was killed? Yes. You said you didn't want a statement. We're not police. OK. Can you see me? What do you think? Walk towards the back of the shop. There. She fell to her left, head closest to the wall, face up. My guess is she never even saw the gun. She was concentrating on the person she could see, trying to break into the back door of the shop. The person she recognised. Paul, but he wasn't alone. No. Someone was trying to break into the lockup, and he had a gun. Terry, do you think? Only Paul can tell us that. I think we need a word with our instructing solicitor. Hello, Mr. Scarsdale. Sorry to call you at home, but I'm afraid we need your help this evening. We need the original crime report of the attempted burglary, and we'd like you to speak to the owner of the van that pops inside Bundy's yard. Thank you, James. A little goes a long way with me. Do you travel much? Well, in the winter, when the flat gets lonely and depressing. I envy Edward's family. Do you work? Yes. I own a modelling agency in Bond Street. We, we hand a lot of men as well. Sounds very glamorous. Well, not really. It's very hard work. And then when Alistair died, I, I didn't have any time for living. There's so much I still want to do. Grab it while you can, that's my motto. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I thought you might need a hand. Oh, I think I've got it all under control. It was very kind of you to invite me. I hope you haven't found it too awkward. Lizzie, I think you should know that at the moment your father and I are just good friends. The trouble is, I know he'd like it to be more than that. He's wonderful company, but as long as you understand, I'm not after the family silver. She only wants a bit of fun. No strings attached. I just don't want him to get hurt. I hope I've still got his pulling power at 70. Maybe I should tell him. Well, why not let him enjoy himself while it lasts? Well, at least they can't get into trouble at their age. Scotch, please. I'll get it. Thanks. Keith Wooler. PC Wooler? Of course. It's not looking very hopeful, is it? I'm sorry. Uh, I shouldn't really discuss the case. No. No one listens to me anyway. It's just a uniform. 
I've been working on that estate since 85. I've been watching it go downhill ever since. More and more kids on the scrap heap every year. None of my bosses gave a monkeys, of course, till this happened. Now, some of them seem to care a little bit too much. Just a gut feeling. Good luck. You're gonna need it. Ah, James, great minds. Brandy, please, large one, room number 10. Oh, I need something to restore my wounded digestion. <laughs> Never again will I suffer one of Maitre Derrick's microwave blanquette de boeuf. <laughs> oh, thank you. Mm. I suppose a um, sneak preview of the defense is out of the question. I'm still hoping for some last minute inspiration. My officers certainly can't see any chinks in our armor. No. I don't suppose they can. Another? No, thanks. I thought I'd just pop out for a quick kebab. You fancy one? Good God, no. Do you do this often? Only on away matches. Sleep tight, Peter. Good evening. Uh, a regular with uh, chili and onions, please. Late night for you. One fifty. Thank you. Smells good. Favorite. I'll be waiting. Well, me too. Yes. Bye. James will be back tonight. I thought we might all have dinner together. Oh, that would be very nice. Lizzie, you don't altogether approve of Claudia and me, do you? I've nothing to lose. We always go Dutch. asking the court to intervene to prevent Miss Baruba being placed into grave, perhaps even mortal, danger. She is not a criminal. She does not remain in this country in the expectation of favor or advantage. She does not even remain here out of choice. She simply asks that this precious justice, which we take for granted, and the cause of which she has fought for so fearlessly in her own country, now be extended to safeguard her liberty. My Lord, we are all aware of the political pressures under which the Immigration Service operates. My client may well be one of 40,000 applicants for asylum, but in signing the Geneva Convention, this country agreed to honor a principle far higher than mere administrative efficiency. If these courts cannot provide shelter to the persecuted, then we have lost the right to call ourselves a civilized nation. Run 
past me full pelt, 30 or 40 seconds after I heard the shot. You are certain it was him? I have seen him around the estate since he was knee high. Did anything else about him catch your eye? Yeah, I think he was holding something in his hand. I couldn't see clearly what it was, but I think it was probably a gun. Are you sure you weren't mistaken about the identity of the person you saw? No, it was Paul Warwick, all right. I'd recognise that little tea leaf anywhere. Bad news, he is. What was he wearing that night? Big white trainers, jeans and a dark T-shirt. You gave exactly those details to the police minutes after you say you saw him, didn't you? When they were perfectly fresh in your mind. Aye. But you didn't say anything about this gun. It's strange you should forget something so vital. I didn't know what it was at the time. I, I just knew he was holding something. Come on, Mr. Yates. You'd just heard a gunshot. You would have noticed if seconds later Paul Warwick ran past holding a thumping great piece of hardware like this. It happened so fast. Since you made your statement, has anyone encouraged you to embellish your evidence? A policeman, perhaps? No. Or maybe in your own mind you put two and two together and made five. You're calling me a liar? Not at all, Mr. Yates. I am simply saying that most people's memories fade with time. Strangely, yours seems to do the opposite. Mr. Kavner will doubtless attack the reliability of this confession. Are you able to reassure us? I am absolutely satisfied it was genuine. What makes you so sure in this case? It was the way he seemed to be taking pleasure in boasting, taunting us with what he'd done. You must have been very close to W.P.C. Kemble, in a professional sense. Of course. Where were you on the evening of Friday the 15th of October, two weeks before she was murdered? I don't know. Didn't you go for a drink with her after work? I can't remember. A note in her diary for that day reads, drink with D-I-W. Might that be Detective Inspector Washbrook? A lot of us go out after work on a Friday. Do you recognize that wallet? It's got WPC Kemble's initials on it. Would you look in the back compartment? There's a piece of paper. Tell us what it is, please. It's a doctor's certificate in her name. Dated? 16th of October. Saturday, the 16th of October. What is it for? Sharing PC4. Otherwise known as the morning after pill. Did she have a boyfriend? Not that I knew of. She must have been sleeping with someone. Since she didn't collect this prescription, one could conclude that she was not altogether unhappy with the idea of being pregnant. Your initials appear quite frequently in a diary. Sometimes it says meet D-I-W. Sometimes the initials appear by themselves next to what look like little hand-painted love hearts. Have you any idea what they may have signified? I don't know what you're suggesting. You were having an affair with Claire Campbell, weren't you? I'm a married man. 
Some people might think it unethical for a detective to be heading an investigation into the death of his girlfriend. She was not my girlfriend. All right, mistress, if you prefer. We'll take that as the officer's last word on that subject, Mr. Kavanagh. But it must have been very difficult for you interviewing a lad you suspected of murdering a colleague. Of course. Especially when you had no doubt that Mr. Warwick was guilty. The evidence against him was overwhelming. But you needed a confession to get home and dry, didn't you? The confession has been ruled admissible, Mr. Kavanagh. Any nut will crack if you stamp on it hard enough, isn't that right, officer? I don't want to warn you again. Very good, my love. Let's have a look at some of this overwhelming evidence, shall we? These pictures of the yard were taken by our solicitor early this morning. Look at the first one. You'll see a transit van parked outside the lockup. Was it there on the night of Claire's death? Yes. This picture was taken from the point that Claire was shot. You can't see much of the lockup door at all, can you? No. The second photograph shows what she would have seen if she was looking straight ahead. Tell the jury what we can see. The back corner of the shop. Isn't it likely that in her radio message, she was referring to someone at the back door of the shop rather than the door of the lockup? Maybe, but it doesn't the prove The position anything. of her body is consistent with her being shot from the right. The back door of the shop was straight in front of her. She couldn't see the lock-up door at all. She saw him. She said so. And if it was Mr. Warwick at the back door of the shop, which showed signs of attempted entry, the killer must have crept unseen around the side of the van. Did it never occur to you that perhaps there was more than one burglar? It was a possibility. But not one that you bothered to investigate. The evidence led us straight to him. We are talking about a lad who's never committed a violent offence in his life. He confessed. Innocent people don't do that. And that's the best you can offer, is it? Bushbook's hardly going to admit they've got the wrong person. You think I'm wrong about Terry? Doesn't really matter, does it? The one thing that could help you, you can't use. What are you going to do? I'll have to call Paul. He's a liability, James. Peter will wipe the floor with him. Good. Unless he gets hurt, he's got no chance of helping himself. You've never been very nervous of policemen, have you, Mr. Warwick? Why should I be? Perhaps most of them. And yet, after your arrest, you found them so threatening that you were frightened into confessing. You're no stranger to police questioning, are you? You should try it. You had a perfectly competent solicitor who explained to you your rights? Is that what you call it? So, it appears that you made your confession entirely of your own free will. You try saying nothing when you've been nicked by those bastards. I suggest the reason you confessed was because you are, in fact, guilty of murder. I never done it. How many times do I have to tell you? Then please take this opportunity to explain to the jury why you had Claire's blood on your training shoe. And why Mr. Yates identified you as the person he saw running away after the gunshot. I don't know. You see, without explanation for these things, we can only come to one conclusion, can't we? You were in that yard when Claire Kemble was shot. 
Answer the question, Mr. Warwick. You were there? No. And you fired the gun that killed her? No. You went out to commit a burglary and you took a gun. When Claire Campbell was unfortunate enough to surprise you, you chose to shoot her rather than face arrest. I've told you. I was at home. Then you walked up to her body and checked to see if she was dead. No doubt if she was still breathing, you would have shot her again. A woman who had shown you nothing but warmth, kindness, and compassion. You did walk up to her. No. And then you confessed to her murder. Because you were overcome with what I can only imagine must have been a pretty sickening sense of guilt. Thankfully, whatever else you may have lacked, you still possessed a guilty conscience. Re-examination, Mr. Kavanagh? My lord, yes. You've told the court that you were at home throughout the evening that Claire was shot. Who was in the house? My brother Terry and my ma, when she came home. What time was that? About ten. What were you doing? Watching telly. All evening? Yeah. What was on? I don't know. Some film. Can't you remember? I'm surprised it isn't engraved on your memory. I, I fell asleep. When? Was that before or after your mum came home? After. So what were you watching when she came home? The news, I, th I think. Did you leave the house at any stage? No. Was that usual? Most lads of your age, they go out with their mates on a Friday night, don't they? I was looking after Terry, wasn't I? Wasn't he old enough to look after himself? So you spent the evening, nice and cosy, watching telly with your little brother? Yeah. Did you ever take Terry out in the evenings? Not really. You must have got bored sitting at home all the time. He can't go out. He's in court today. Seems to get around. Why couldn't you take him out? He's ill. He's got brain damage. He has moods. He, he gets upset. How did this brain damage happen? You must remember. In a car crash. The car crashed into a wall. He hit his head. Who was the driver? What's that got to do with it? It's a simple enough question. I was. Stolen car? Well, it wasn't mine. What happened to Terry afterwards? I took him into care. He wanted to come. I couldn't stop him. How did your mother react? Who did she blame? I don't see the point of this. I've told you it was an accident, for God's sake. You were driving. Who do you blame? Was there anyone for you to turn to? Anyone who understood how you felt? There was one person. Would you say Claire Kemble was a good friend to you? I suppose. Where did you meet her? Down the youth club. The Young Offenders Group? Yeah. Your probation officer sent you there after your last burglary conviction, didn't he? When you started going to the club, you were out of trouble for six whole months. What brought that about? Terry came home. I had to look after him, didn't I? No. He never stopped you going out stealing before. 
What were your feelings towards Claire Kemble? She was all right. She wasn't just out to nick you. What about her looks? Personality? We've heard what her colleagues thought. How did you rate her? She was... You know... Kind. Was she kind to you? Yeah. How? I don't know. She didn't criticize. Have there been others like her in your life? Anyone who didn't expect you to take the blame? Who could see some good in you? A training shoe covered with her blood was found in your bedroom 20 minutes after she died. Whose was it? You and Terry share the room. It's got to belong to one of you. Answer the question, Mr. Warwick. It was mine. That puts you in the yard, doesn't it? So who was looking after Terry? Me, ma. What time does she finish work? She came home early. During the 10 o'clock news? Yeah. Really? She told the police that she was indoors with you and Terry all evening. Was she lying? Didn't you tell us that looking after Terry in the evenings was your responsibility? I think you and Terry went out together while your mother was still at work. Did your mother know about the gun you kept in your bedroom? I don't know. It doesn't fire anyway. It is yours? Yes. Do you know anyone else who's got a gun like it? A lot of the lads on the estate. Like Damon Marshall? Has he ever had one that fires? How should I know? Where do these guns come from? Magazines. Buy them off, mate. But yours came from a dealer in Dagenham. Have you ever been to Dagenham, Paul? No. What about when Terry was in a children's home in Hornchurch? It's not a million miles away, is it? A couple of stops by train? Oh, no. Didn't you ever go and visit him? Yeah. So who got hold of them, you or him? You got hold of them somehow. They didn't get from a dealer in Dagenham to your house by magic. All the kids up there had them. I didn't want them to be left out. They were real hard cases. You bought your brother a gun so that he could impress the other kids. And that was your idea of a helping hand, was it? They were beating him up, taking the piss. What was I meant to do? Did your mother know about this? And you got one for yourself while you were at it. They didn't work. Terry's did? I don't know what happened when he was up there. There were kids who knew. They knew how to... Reactivate guns. He changed. He started nicking. He went really mental. The gun you bought for Terry is the one that killed Claire Kemble. Killed the only person in the world who really believed in you. And all the jury know for certain is that moments after she was shot, you were standing in a pool of her blood watching her die. Are you going to take the blame again? Whose idea was it to go out, yours or Terry's? Who brought the gun along, you or him? He wanted to go, not me. I was going straight. Who pulled the trigger, you or him? We were skint. It wasn't much. Just a scabby shop. There was no one even in. Who killed Claire Kemp? I never knew it could fire. He didn't tell me. No one was meant to get hurt. But he was your responsibility. He didn't mean to blow her away. He was like a kid with a toy. It wasn't my fault. He was out of control. No! Paul, don't tell her anything! We weren't there!
You may think, members of the jury, that the effect of Mr. Warwick's evidence was to seek to pass the blame onto his brother. Now, if that is your understanding, then he must obviously have been telling lies, either to you or to the police. Now, whether you choose to believe the account he has given here or the confession he made to the police is entirely a matter for you. Madam Foreman, on this indictment it is charged that on the 28th day of October, Paul Anthony Warwick murdered Claire Kemble. On this charge, do you find him guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Thank you, members of the jury. You're free to go, Mr Warwick. Court rise. Well done, James. I knew you'd make a fight of it. Right result. A momentous victory for justice. We won! We won! You were wonderful. Oh, thank you. There really wasn't much to it once I'd mugged up on the law. Maybe I'll become a radical barrister full time. Buy myself a red tie. What do you think? speak to reporters. Has he gone quite mad? Well, it's her loss. She won't find many filthy, rich, elderly peers who can still cha-cha-cha till sun-up. <laughs> Look after yourself. Phone me when you get home. Have you added service to the restaurant meals? Because I did leave service separately. Yes, sir. Well, no, here comes no old coward. You got him off, then? I hear you managed to blame it on the nutter. You won't be making it to our little function, then, Peter. Only our guest speaker's got the flu. Ah, I'd love to, but I have a long-standing engagement in Gray's Inn. James does a rather good after-dinner speech. No, I'm sorry. I've, um, Bolton are on the TV tonight. <clears throat> Cup tie. Shame. Maybe we'll see you again. Not professionally, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we pleased someone. Quite a feat, James. Winning away and keeping the locals happy. I've known sweeter victories. I think we'll mark this one down as a no-score draw. 